Hello, good evening. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, yeah, I'm able to hear you. Sir, check your share screen, sir. Okay. You have to see the screen? Yes, sir. All fine, sir. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah. Fine, sir. All right. We just start in two, three minutes. Sir. Okay, sure. So you, you may close it, sir. I'll introduce you first and then we can start. It, sure. Okay. Stop share? Yeah, stop share. Okay. So uh, after that, we have not. Uh, uh, discussed much, so uh, I have made an odd way. I will be first discussing the CT. Sir, and, sound uh, is not very clear. Sound, sound is not very clear. Blood. Is it okay now? Uh, just sit closer to the thing. My speaker system, sir. That's all. Okay. 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 Yeah. So our idea is that basically the audience is all young students in ways. As such, they don't have much knowledge of CT and MRI, but you know, okay. very important. It's like an X-ray now, at least the CT. So okay. Okay. the very basics you'll have to start with, you know, how to read it, how to differentiate things and like that. And basically sticking to ICU, that's all. Okay. okay. Then I have to we, have to assume, we have to assume they don't know anything that way. Okay. Okay. But it has become very important, sir. Even I find it difficult, you know, even, uh, you know, and you have to at night, especially, you have to get the basic side at least because uh, then you can always check the help. But yes, it's out line or even if you know. Sir, sound layer. Should I use the mic then? Uh, sound to adjust conditions. I'm using uh, earphones. Is it okay now? Yeah, yes, better now. Sir. Okay, okay. Uh, will we be having an interaction with the audience? Sir, also? sir, they may ask some questions. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they don't. Maybe two, three questions. Very, very well. Okay, okay. Or it's not it, an interesting. It, uh, basically, it's, it's a, a lecture, and then it goes up on our YouTube channel. We have a YouTube channel also. Okay, okay. We get a okay. lot of viewing on that also. So there'll be normally there's a participation of two hundred, and then thousands okay. of views on uh, the YouTube because you know students are busy doing duties, etc. Okay. Okay. Uh, so okay, it's very okay. useful on the YouTube also. So they can review it, they review it later on also. Okay. Okay. And YouTube is open to all, not only our forum, anybody can view it on YouTube as you know. Okay, okay. So should we start, sir? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. okay. Uh, welcome, dear friends and colleagues. So today's session is on basic neuroimaging, as many of you had also requested for the session. It's a very important session because, uh, you know, practically every patient gets a CT now has a neuro problem, and many of those uh, go on to get a MRI. And uh, though we can read X-rays, ECGs, CT reading for non-neurologist is a little difficult. So I requested sir for this session and he has very kindly consented to take this session of basics of neuroimaging covering CTs and MRIs. So sir is a professor of neuroradiology and neurointerventional radiology. Professor Samir Vyasar, he's at PJMR Chandigarh and we thank him for making the session and teaching all of us. So what do you say? Thank you, Dr. Tapesh for the introduction.
no i will be sharing my screen is it visible yes sir please carry on okay uh thank you uh, uh for giving me this uh, uh opportunity to speak on a basic neuroimaging so i will begin with the imaging modalities we have for imaging the brain then i will be briefly discussing the basic anatomy how should be uh, uh, see the lesions or uh, characterize a the lesion then as uh, dr tapesh has asked for the few advances or the other modalities in the ct in the mri and then i will be showing the representative image of the common pathologies in the emergency ct and mri so uh just i will be switching off my video yes sir that's okay so uh, the two uh, important modalities we have is the ct and the mri the ct the the main advantage is it's a wide surface ability it's a cost effective very quickly acquired acquired within a minutes it's useful in those patients in which mri is contraindicated the main limitation is radiation exposure and if required the contrast study the exposure to the ionized contrast mri overcomes almost all its limitations the the, the but the, the limitations uh, of the like uh, it's a uh, excellent details of the neuro anatomy can be seen on a mri and it is very useful in characterizing the pathologies though it's a uh, slightly costly than the ct and availability is a uh, limited especially in a far flung areas so i will begin with Uh, how we should approach a ct scan so normally uh, a ct scan head is acquired in a uh, axial images with the caudal to cranial directions so first and foremost we should know whether it is a normal or a abnormal how that we should know the first is a uh, identification of the abnormality or the lesion localization for that we should divide the brain into a right and the left hemisphere and try to see look for any asymmetry whether there is any structures are asymmetric whether ventricle sulcal spaces parenchymal the basal ganglia region thalami or we try to look for a differential density other than the normal gray or white matter if we find some pathology then we try to characterize the lesion by the contrast enhancement we should begin with the, the from the caudal region the brain stem we should able to outline the normal structure the, the brain stem like which constitutes of a medulla then the pons the mid brain the cerebellar hemispheres then we had the basal ganglia region bilateral lateral ventricles frontal horn the occipital horn then the uh, sylvian uh, fissure then interhemispheric fissures then the, the internal capsule i will be uh, further discussing these in a mr also just to outline the major relevant anatomical structures and then in the superior cuts we should able to see the gray matter the white matter or any any symmetry or any other abnormality so after looking the, for the symmetry look for a the high differential the uh, attenuation on a ct which we call a hypodensity or a hyperdensity in a hypodensity the commonly abnormality what we see is a cytotoxic edema a cytotoxic edema what on imaging or radiologists we understand it's usually involves both a uh, gray matter and a uh, white matter and depending upon the pathology whether it's a ischemic or other other pathologies it varies the next is a basogenic edema which we understand is a finger like projection predominantly involving the mainly the white matter and relatively spares the, the cortex or the gray matter then we have a the interstitial edema which is due to the obstructive hydro uh, cephalus and transependymal leakage of the cfs in, into the periventricular white matter 
Then we have a various pattern. If we see a basogenic edema, try to look for any differential hyperdensity or a differential attenuation. Look for whether it is a single lesion like this in the posterior temporal region or there are other multiple lesions also in the same hemisphere or other hemisphere. Again, do not leave, once you see another patho single pathology, look for other pathologies like in this case, there is a hypodensity here and hyperdensity in the posterior part of the superior sexual sinus. So that helps in you to understand the pathology and making a diagnosis. In a hyperdensity, the commonest, most common scene is the bone. Then we have a blood. Blood it depends upon the stage or the evolution of a normal blood. It may be intraparenchymal. It may be in a subarachnoid space, as in, in this case, or the extraparenchymal, in the, like in this EDH or intraventricular. So you should be very careful in looking for the asymmetry, looking for a differential hyperdensity or a hypodensity, or sometimes a very subtle hyperdensity along the convexity margins, which I will be subsequently discussing how to recognize such subtle abnormalities on a routine CT scan in emergency situations when you are not aware what's going there in a patient. Other important calcification, which can be clearly and easily seen on a CT, the, the multiple calcified fossae, which usually represent a dystrophic calcification, maybe because of the granulomas or other pathologies. Before we uh, begin discussing the, the uh, CT in emergency, we should be briefly have an outline what we are looking for and what is windowing CT. Windowing CT as a layman is a grayscale mapping, means we are changing the, the, the grayscale setting of our screen. So in a routine brain, what we see in the normal brain, it, it is seen in the 40, the uh, uh, centering is around 40. Why 40? Because mean attenuation of the gray and white matter is a 40 HU. HU is a, maybe measure the uh, uh, attenuation of a, in comparison to the water with the HU. And then the, we have a width, we have a, like a range, how much we are able to see. So in a normal brain, in a supratentorial, we do a setting of a 40 to 80 HU. But in a, some conditions like in this, there is a very subtle abnormality. And when we change the window setting to a, like a stroke window setting, which we do in an institute around 30, 30 or 40, 40, we can clearly delineate the abnormality. Like this is a right MCA territory in fog, which is very subtle and difficult to uh, perceive what when we change the window setting, we can clearly see a large wedge-shaped hypodensity in the frontal, temporal, and parietal region with mild mass effect and uh, indenting the ventricles. Next is the, the wide window setting or which in a brain we commonly call as a subdural window setting. So in a in an acute or hyperacute extra parenchymal hemorrhages may merge with the overlying bone and we sometimes are not able to perceive the subtle subdural hemorrhages which are there. So in such conditions we should change the window setting to a wide window setting which is usually that we slightly widen it like we were keeping a attenuation of a 40 centering now switch over to 60, 150, what we commonly use. But it's, it's a user, uh, depends upon user to user. So we can change the window setting from 50 to 100 to window width of maybe up to the 300. And then we have a bone window setting uh, simply to see the subtle fractures, especially in a trauma patient. So we switch over to the bone window setting. I'm audible and clear. Uh, yes, sir. Very clear, sir. Okay, okay. Then next comes in any emergency is a localization of the hemorrhage. We should able to localize the hyperdensity, what we have discussed in the previous slides. I will just uh, run through again the 
parenchymal hemorrhage subarachnoid hemorrhage extra parenchymal which are subdural or extra dural so first and foremost any hyperdensity we should able to localize the whether it is a subarachnoid because if it's a non traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage the most likely cause in the basal system is a aneurysm then in a subarachnoid hemorrhage try to localize whether it is in a basal system or along the convexity then look for other sites like whether the hemorrhage is in the basal ganglia because each site has a um, uh, limited differential diagnosis and you may help in arriving at some uh, important diagnosis and uh, like in the low back uh, hemorrhages and the di common differential diagnosis are you will aware of amyloid angiopathy venous infarct or a vascular mark formation in addition in the parenchymal hemorrhages especially low back look whether they are a gyral or a cortical hemorrhage or a the gray white matter junction that further helps to discriminate the venous infarct or a hemorrhagic transformation of a large peripheral arterial infarction in a extra parenchymal we should able to distinguish between the epidural hemorrhage and the subdural hemorrhage i will be discussing with the few the examples and the relative soft pointers to discriminate these two so these are again important from imaging uh, and uh, management point of view and then look for a subtle diffuse axonal injury pattern like the, the where there the areas where there is a shear injury look for like a corpus callosum or a grave amyloid junction there it be the diffuse axonal injury changes and then look in the the busy frontal and the busy temporal region especially in the trauma patients for the contusions then the important comes is a in a how to differentiate between a edh and sdh the edh is typically a lentiform shape it's a lens shape biconvex it do not crosses the suture line the usually the causes is a accidental injury and there is a rupture of the middle meningeal artery the sdh it's a crescent shape or a concave convex it crosses the sutures internal margins of this usually parallels the the cortex it is usually in long accidental injury and seen in an elderly the usual causative is a rupture of the bridging vein or the dural sinuses the next important is the attenuation of our hemorrhages the blood changes its attenuation with passage of time like in a hyper acute stage means within hours it is usually iso or hypodense so in such conditions it's difficult to perceive so we should do it uh, change the window setting and the window level to a narrow so that we can appreciate the differential hypodensity then comes the acute stage in which the clot retracts from the plasma uh, and then we can see the differential hypodensity and then as the time passage after 3 to 7 days it usually becomes a isodense or hypodense and after around 3 weeks it becomes isodense to the, the csf or the ventricles and then sometimes we see a layered appearance in a chronic cases which may be due to the acute on chronic sdh so this is a csf attenuation of this extra parenchymal likely subdural hemorrhage because it is crossing the the suture line and this is a differential hyperintensity i will be similarly discussing the, the different the the uh, signal intensity of the hemorrhage in a mri with the examples in a mri section so next important in a ct we have to uh, understand and see the pattern of the contrast enhancement so enhancement as in other brain pathology can be extra axial extra axial i mean to say it's outside the brain parenchyma then we have a meningeal it can be leptomeningeal enhancement or a pachymeningeal enhancement then we can have a parenchymal and the various pattern of the parenchymal enhancement and then we can have a periventricular or a ependymal enhancement in a extra axial the common is 
uh, neoplasms like uh, melan uh, meningioma or uh, other meningoepithelial tumors which causes this type of the enhancement and the buckling of the grape ventral junction and uh, metastasis which can uh, can also causes the this extra axial enhancement then we have a diffuse thickening and enhancement of the pecky meninges that is the dura and it is commonly seen in in the post op patients or the in, in special entity is the intracranial hypotension in which we should also look for the chinked ventricles the common enhancement which we look for in meninges is the lepto meningia that is the pyro pya arachnoid that which dips into the the sulcal or a interfolial spaces this is a good example in which you can see the enhancement of the along the interfolial spaces so that is this enhancement is in the pya arachnoid and this is commonly seen in meningitis meningoencephalitis though it may be seen in the meningeal carcinomatosis or meningeal lymphomatosis so we have to see it and characterize the different pattern of the enhancement then comes the important is the the uh, gyral enhancement and we have to discriminate it from the leptomeningeal enhancement because the 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 etiology of both the gyral enhancement and the leptomeningeal enhancement is different so in the leptomeningeal enhancement the sulcal spaces are effaced they will not be seen whereas is in the superficial gyral enhancement we see the cortical enhancement but the you can clearly delineate the sulcal spaces it is usually represents a ischemic or a inflammatory pathology and not seen in neoplastic pathology so when whenever any cortical lesions and demonstrating the the gyral enhancement we should think of a like subacute infarction or a some encephalitis then we have a nodular enhancement of the lesion which is the parenchyma which present a various neoplastic or infectious processes in a parenchymal enhancement the usually seen pattern is the peripheral enhancement it may be a smooth like a, what we commonly see is a ring ring enhancement a commonly used terminology in a ct and mri a smooth ring with a smooth inner and outer margin or it may be have rig or a irregular inner margin and it has a differentials of each pattern of the enhancement then may we may see a uh, the uh, in, in nodular enhancement of a large cystic lesion or the ependymal enhancement but i have discussed which may be seen in a lymphoma or other cases like ventriculitis so with this uh, overview and the ct i will be showing a few of the cases and then we can be in discussing but uh, somehow this is not Uh, interactive other, otherwise we could have discussed the cases so this is a uh, uh, ncct head of a young uh, patient with a sudden severe headache what we see we should see from the the cord or cranial but what we see is the hyper density which is outlining the the basal system the peri mesenchymal system the sylvian fissures and can clearly see the there is a effacement and hyperdensity in the suprasellar system it is extending superiorly into the sylvian fissure the interhemispheric fissure to the patient are you able to see my arrow also yes, sir, it's clear sir please carry on no problem okay 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 so in this case uh, as i have discussed the what we have on a ct scan is a basal pattern of the subarachnoid hemorrhage so in such cases the most common is a uh, the uh, cerebral aneurysms and we do a uh, uh, ct angio immediately and ct angio showing the the pcom and the communicating ic aneurysms which is clearly delineated on a ct angiography vrt images and mpr images so these are different reformation for ct angiography in a cerebral vasculature we commonly use the mip images and the vrt images for better demonstration of the arterial anatomy another 
patient, uh, middle-aged female with same sudden severe headache in a posterior fossa, what we are seeing is uh, the hyperdensity in the posterior fossa, the CP angle, we have a fourth ventricular bleed and just see the, the tentorium, there is a hyperdensity, so likely representing a marked posterior fossa subarachnoid hemorrhage and it is extending superiorly involving the bilateral sylvian fissures and there is a small component in the ventricles also. You can clearly see the hemorrhage in the dependent part. So whenever you want to see the intraventricular hemorrhage, always look at the dependent portions. CT angiography immediately then shows multiple torturous vessels in the posterior fossa for this, uh, suspecting a dural AVF, uh, the DSA was done and which showed a dural arteriovenous malformation. So it's very important to recognize the pattern and subsequently order the investigation, whether we are looking, going for a CT NGO, MR NGO or a DSA directly. This is uh, another patient, a young boy, a 12 year female, uh, who presented with a large right temporo-occipital hemorrhage because of the marked herniation, brainstem herniation, decompressive hemicrinotomy was done with uh, uh, suspicion of a vascular malformation uh, directly, a DSA was performed and it showed a vascular malformation, arteriovenous malformation in the right temporal region. And these are the dynamic images which clearly delineate the arterial feeding anatomy and the venous drainage into the transverse sinus. The other important, the causes of the intraparenchymal hemorrhages are like this. These are capsuloganglionic hemorrhages, which are involving the, the basal ganglia and the, the capsule. The most common, as we all are aware, is uh, the hypertensive hemorrhages, and we should see the pattern, the edema, the mass effect, and clearly try to rule out other causes also. So in an ICH, we should be able to localize the hemorrhages in the particular region, which area is involved, the pattern, and the, any it means the, where it is located or the pattern, whether it is a single hemorrhage or a multiple hemorrhage, so that the subsequently the patient can be bugged depending upon the provisional pattern of the intracerebral hemorrhage. These are the post-traumatic patients, like this is a, uh, the uh, extradural hemorrhage with a counter coup injury, and you can clearly delineate the opposite side the cortical contusion this is the same patient with the, the intraventricular hemorrhage and down below there is a large uh, right temporal hemorrhagic contusion also. Another patient's trauma because in, in the most uh, ICU patients, many patients are trauma. So I was just showing the spectrum. So we are not only limited to the seeing the one of the large abnormality. We should look for the other patterns like this patient. There are multiple busy temporal hemorrhages. There is small, subtle uh, subdural hemorrhages, which is along the right front row, temporal and parietal convexity. And look for the counter coup injuries or other like diffuse axonal injury, other subtle hemorrhages and hypodensity to understand the, the extent of the injury and for the prognostication of the patient. This is uh, uh, another patient in which it has a SDH and a post drainage, but we see a differential hypodensity and a small air spec after the post drainage. This is uh, uh, another patient in a, a post trauma patient which has a large uh, left uh, temporal hemorrhage and a cortical contusion uh, uh, up along the right, likely due to the a counter coup pattern and you can clearly delineate the scalp swelling. So look carefully in the scalp region that helps in understanding the, the pattern of injury and the extent of the injury. And in a trauma, as I uh, already started in the beginning that we should look for the bone window to look for the 
fractures of the overlying calvaria. This is another patient with the right hemiparesis. Now, what we see in here is the this. We look for the asymmetry here. Uh, the left lateral ventricle is effaced. There is a large wedge-shaped area which is uh, involving the left frontal, temporal, and parietal region. The basal ganglia is also involved. So this is a cytotoxic edema, and kid patient is presented with the right hemiparesis. CT angio was done, and it shows a complete occlusion of the the uh, left. MCA distal to its bifurcation. There may be different patterns depending upon, like in this, the patient with a valvular heart disease, we can appreciate a multiple small wedge-shaped areas of the arterial infarction in the variable territory with the interspersed small hemorrhages, which suggestive of uh, the, the, the thromboemboli the, uh, from the valvular heart disease with the small hemorrhagic transformation. In other important causes of a hypodensity is look for the, the territorial involvement. Like in this patient with the altered sensorium, this patient where the hypodensity is involving the right temporal, frontal, and the uh, posterior temporal also. So this is not not any uh, following any vascular territory. So in a patient with a altered sensorium, we should think of the other pathologies like the uh, encephalitis. And this was a case of a herpes encephalitis. Retrospectively, you can now start saying that there is a, a involvement of the opposite side also. So in a in an acute setting, setting, look for the hypodensity, whether it is involving the gray matter, white matter, then look for the various vascular territories and look for the other subtle changes which can be better brought out by changing the window setting and the window bit which I have discussed. This is a patient with the, uh, the hydrocephalus. In this case, I've just kept it to complete the, the spectrum of our, like this is a posterior fossa tumor with a cystic changes and a solid component. So sometimes they are also present with a, an acute emergency and we should be well aware and able to at least delineate the possible cause of the, the, uh, the altered sensorium or the other pathologies. This is another patient and sometimes the, the, the focal hyperdensity or is so subtle we have to be very uh, systematic in seeing the, the uh, abnormal differential uh, hyperdensity like this is in the region of the basilar top. This is a small hyperdensity in the left MCA bifurcation region. So we should be systematically analyzing whether it's a section to section you follow from a cordocranial or a means yeah, you follow the organ wise approach. You first see the, all the sulci, then the, the basal cisterns, then the ventricle system, and then the basal ganglia. It's an individual approach, you can follow anything, but it's uh, better to have a section-wise approach so that you do not miss any pathology. This is uh, uh, another patient just to uh, showing the spectrum that the ventricles are grossly dilated and there is hypodensity in the, the periventricular white matter, likely representing the obstructive hydrocephalus and there is a dilatation of the fourth ventricle. So most likely, this is a sequelae of the meningitis with obstructive hydrocephalus. And when we do a contrast in enhanced CT scan, we clearly delineate the, the florid basal meningeal enhancement. So this is a hydrocephalus with the florid enhancement, so likely TBM in our part of the world. And you can clearly delineate in a delayed section the better abnormal enhancement of the basal cisterns. In another patients, these uh, again uh, uh, tubercular spectra portion patients try to see and the differential hypodensities in the, the periventricular white matter or the cortex, which may be a sequelae of the meningovasculitis or the other in, in uh, the other pathology. And sometimes we see the uh, in uh, the uh, extra axial collections, which are showing the peripheral enhancement and in a patient with a post-meningite 
chat is they usually represents the subdural lymphoma though they are better appreciated on uh, the the mr images we should be very uh, systematic in seeing the the these extra axial fluid collections along the frontal and the uh, temporal convexity this is another patient in this as i've shown there is now a post contrast uh, ct scan and there is a diffuse ependymal enhancement and there is a asymmetrical dilatation of the ventricle so likely this ventricle is trapped because of the ventriculitis this is a the patient with the alter sensorium you can clearly see there is the ventricles are chink you cannot appreciate the the, the clearly the gray white matter junction and there is the uh, the brain stem also appears if he is so in such a section in which uh, the the ventricles look chink so you cannot clearly delineate the gray white matter junction it is a the, the most likely of a diffuse cerebral edema i will just outline uh, this uh, ct i will just outline the the uh, other advances in the ct technology i will just give you the outline like what we were discussing we have uh, the 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 recent is multi detector ct so as a interventionist should understand what is mdct so mdct is nothing what we uh, there is a more uh, number of the detector uh, rows so in in a, in, in a single detector we have a single now in, we have put up a multiple rows of the detector so that the images can be acquired with the much higher speed and the volumetric data can be acquired so we acquire with the volumetric ct of 12256 we acquire images like this which gives a demonstration of the entire cervical cranial vasculature then we have our dual energies ct the the main advantage it can help in providing the material properties of the tissue and differentiation between the tissues that have a similar attenuation i'll be just showing with the example like this the emergency patient and we acquired the contrast enhanced section only so we do not have a nccct section so in such cases it's very important we take a uh, uh, idn map images and uh, unsubstructured images can be obtained from this and the enhancing portion and the hemorrhages can be clearly delineated the other important is in a emergency sometimes there is a difficulty in differentiating whether it is a hemorrhage or a calcification so in this also the dual energy ct scan provide a reliable discrimination by uh, getting a unmasked imager or bone obstructed images and we can clearly delineate that this is a small focus of a hemorrhage in the posterior midbrain the Uh, dual energy uh, ct is also helpful in giving the better images of the ct angiography or it also helps in removing the surgical clips in a cone beam just there are number of uh, in a md ct that we increase the number of detectors now in the cone beam ct we have a cone beam of the ct it is useful in dental imaging and temporal bone imaging for a internist more important is a portable ct as we know standard ct they are large they are not suitable for the patients who are critically ill patients uh, in the icus as well as a patient undergoing surgery there is significant morbidity and uh, associated with transporting the critical ill patients to the imaging area especially the the, the mainly the imaging areas are far from the the icus so portable ct is provides the, that uh, provision and uh, that can be moved from one place to another place like we have in under this uh, portable ct in our icu so that the patients can be imaged immediately or we can acquire a perioperative cross sectional images in the operation theater itself but we should be well aware that there are chances of the scattered radiation for the staff and public from ionizing radiations as a portable ct cannot be shielded as the stationary ct the cost is though high it is considered viable because there is a significant problem associated with transporting the patients to the the main operating rooms the application in ct 
includes the like CT angiography, CT perfusion, CT venography. I'll just outlining like CT angiography is nothing but a rapid acquisition of the isotropic data. And we acquire in, in a, like a contrast result phase imaging. And uh, what we get is an angiographic like images. And they are very important for delineating extracranial, intracranial various pathologies. And these pathologies can be very nicely demonstrated on a CT angiographic reconstructed images. The main advantage in uh, uh, comparison to the DSA, it clearly delineates the anatomy with the bony structures in contrast to the, the DSA. The CT perfusion, this is the, what we do is a serial imaging of the area of interest following a, the infusion of the contrast. So uh, this is the, the, the indication of a CT perfusion lies in the like, stroke trauma or a tumor. We draw various maps and look for the mismatch between the blood volume and the blood flow so that the penumbra or the, the uh, possible ischemic uh, area can be salvaged in the various techniques. And uh, just to show the example of a CT in an emergency setting, like uh, this patient, there is subtle hypo density involving the, the insular region and the right frontotemporal region. Changing the window setting clearly delineate a large area of uh, the uh, right MCA territory infarction. CT and geography done show the uh, occlusion of the superior division, which can be demonstrated on a various reformatted images. We then uh, CT perfusion, whether should be taken for a, uh, the uh, thrombectomy or not. So it is not a significant mismatch because patient presented after around eight hours. So in, in such cases, we usually do a CT perfusion to delineate the ischemic penumbra. Other important is a CT venography. And the CT venography gives us uh, the angiographic lime images and clear demonstration of the clot in the superior testal sinus or the, in the transfer sinuses. Uh, I've just completed the, the CT. I will be now just giving an overview of the, the MRI. Uh, am I uh, uh, yes, clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, uh, I thought as in clinicians, I should give you overview what we are imaging with the MRI. So with MRI, there are many MR active nuclei, but in a clinical practice, what we do is the hydrogen uh, imaging that is only looking for the hydrogen nuclei. So in a routine body, the, the hydrogen atoms are randomly placed when we place the human body into the main magnet they either align parallel or anti-parallel to the main magnetic field depending upon their energy state. Usually the low energy state align parallel and high energy state align anti-parallel. And when we give a radio frequency energy, few of the these MR active nuclei acquire energy and tend to align anti-parallel. And when we remove this radio frequency energy, as in an homeostasis, they tend to fall back to their low energy state. And during this process, the uh, radio frequency energy is released and that forms the, the basis of the, the uh, signal intensity what we are getting. And this is changes with the, the time. So it's called a free induction decay. The sequences are spin echo or a gradient echo or a inversion sequences. I will not be going because there is a lot of complex uh, further, so I will be limiting to the the, uh, the clinicians what we see and what we acquire for our brain. In a brain, the basic sequences what we acquire in a routine practice is T1, T2, player, DWI, ADC, GRE. We may add the post guard images to further characterize the lesion. Additional sequences which may be done. To, for characterizing the pathologies are MR NGO, MR venography, high resolution sequences, and these are the advanced sequences. 
So in a routine uh, brain MRI, as I have told, we acquire T2 images, the flare images, and the T1 images. The T2 images, usually in the most of the vendors or the machines, the, the sequence name is usually uh, written on the right-hand side of this. So you can clearly identify sometimes few clinicians say that we have difficulty in interpreting the sequences. So you can clearly see the most of the machines or vendors clearly mentioned which sequence, like this is T, T2 TSC sequence and other parameters also. In a T2 sequences, the CSF is bright. In a T1 sequences, the CSF is like fluid. And as this says, the white matter is white and gray matter is gray. This is reverse for a, the T2 sequences. And when we see a, a mixture, the uh, CSF is dark and uh, the brain is slightly uh, hyperdense and there is a decreased gray white matter attenuation. This is a flare sequence. Then we have two other important sequence, the DWI. Again, as I mentioned, usually the most of the sequence parameters are written on the screen also because it may be confused with the other sequence. So look in the, the scan parameters, there is always written which sequence. This is diffusion sequence. This is a ADC map for better correlating the diffusion images. Then we have this very important, the SWI. Again, it written in all most of the scanners. The SWI, this is a magnitude and you can clearly see the phase images for discriminating the hemorrhage from the calcification. Then we have uh, advanced sequences like the post-contrast sequences along with the perfusion or spectro can be acquired. In a spine, what we do is the T1 weighted images, the T2 weighted images, the T2 fat set or star sequences for detecting the marrow edema of the vertebral body and for characterizing as in the brain, we do a uh, post-GAD images. Though uh, use limited, uh, it may be useful in characterizing the pathologies, the diffusion and GRE, though there are many artifacts while acquiring. In a spine, they usually, the T2 spine, again, uh, the, the, uh, look for the CSA, whether it is a bright or a dark, and look in the uh, right-hand side, the, usually the parameters or a sequence name is are usually written. So this is T2. These are T1 weighted whole spine screening. These are star images better demonstrating the any marrow edema or pathology. And these are the axial T2 and T1 images. The uh, contrast uh, MRI is done with the paramagnetic uh, compounds. Usually these are the gadolinium contrast. They causes the T1 shortening. The contrast agents are linear or um, macrocyclic. Uh, recently, there has been a significant uh, discussion about the gadolinium deposition in the brain, in, in which the brain, there is a uh, progressive accumulation of the, the, this gadolinium contrast, especially the linear. So macrocyclic MRI contrast agents are better in contrast to the linear uh, agents. And usually they are not recommended when the GFR is less than 30. The MR is uh, also helpful in delineating the various velocities or the, the, the flowing things in the brain, like in the arteries, the flow can be seen with the MR NGO in the veins, the MR venography. In the capillary, the, the flow can be made with the perfusion technique and in intercellular spaces, it is done with the, the diffusion images. So these are the angiographic images clearly delineating the the arterial anatomy up to the second or third order. Commonly used sequences that we use is a top MRI. These are ven venographic images clearly delineating like the superior testal sinus, the transfer sinus, or the sigmoid sinus, straight sinus. So if we know the anatomy, clearly delineate these reformatted images. And the only colored images in the MR available is a perfusion MRI, which and uh, uh, helps in characterizing the pathologies, which can be done with contrast or the without the contrast. And the, this uh, very important technique, the diffusion images, which is because of the Brownian motion of the water. And it is very useful because it 
delineate both the microstructural uh, integrity and the connectivity. That is the cytotoxic edema, then the tissue cellularity. It is useful in delineating the acute infarct, like in this the, uh, left side of the midbrain, there is a hypo, uh, hyper intensity on the T2, there is diffusion restriction. As suggested, I said diffusion restriction because this is dark on a ADC images. So to differentiate whether it is a, a true diffusion restriction or a T2 shine through, always look the ADC images, which are always provided with the diffusion weighted images. These are the, another example of a multiple pyogenic abscess with ventriculitis. You can clearly see the, the lesions which are showing the diffusion restriction. The DTI is nothing but uh, the acquisition of our diffusion in more number of direction with the, the variable V value. So in the DTI, we acquire the, the diffusion images in the multiple directions. And as we increase on increase the number of directions, we get a better information of the, the tracts and the, the anisotropic diffusion. Spectroscopy. It is uh, molecular imaging, and we get uh, a map uh, like this, in which the y-axis denotes the intensity, and the x-axis denotes the frequency. And we get uh, metabolic maps like this, and they help in characterizing the various uh, pathologies. The, the other important sequence is uh, SWI. Uh, because it helps in discriminating a paramagnetic from a diamagnetic. The main is the hemorrhage from the calcification, which was a limitation earlier on the MRI images. Then we have a functional MR imaging in which uh, the uh, various uh, eloquent areas of the brain can be delineated with the extensity. I will be just briefly outlining the, the, the basic anatomy in MRI because that's important for the, the beginners or internists to localize a pathology. So we have a cerebrum in, we, in which the, we, I will be discussing the lower anatomy, the basal ganglia and the diencephalon. So in a, a cerebral hemisphere, identify the cerebral lobes on a MRI. We identify it by the, the various the, uh, landmarks. The, in a radiologically, the, though uh, there are six lobes, so radiologically we divide them into the four lobes. And to identify this, we have to identify the various structures. First is the central sulcus, then the sylvian fissure, then the right occipital fissure, and a visible upper right temporal line. So how do we identify the central sulcus? It was the hallmark. Look the highest section on an axial MR sections. Look for some known branching, deepest posterior pointing. This is the only the sulcus which is posterior pointing and it gives a omega or obsolene uh, appearance. So you can clearly delineate the the central sulcus in most of the scan. Additionally, check for the thickness anterior to this and posterior to this. So anterior to this is a motor cortex. So motor cortex is thicker than the sensory cortex. These are the other sign delineated like but if this is a thicker motor cortex, thinner motor cortex, omega sign. Then there are other signs which delineate the pre-central sulcus. And this is a recently described clearly see in a central sulcus there is a decreased appreciation of the gray white matter junction others have a good uh, appreciation the central sulcus have the less discrimination of the gray white matter junction and just to better show this then this compare the gray matter of this and this there is a attenuation of the uh, gray matter. So in a T1 weighted images, it can be clearly delineated without seeing any other signs. Then we have to see the sylvian fissure. It's uh, uh, literally seen and we can clearly uh, appreciate and delineate the frontal and parietal from the temporal lobes. It has a horizontal ramus, ascending ramus and a posterior ascending ramus. Then in the paramedian, parasitical sections, we should able to delineate the parieto-occipital fissure. 
and it uh, as the name suggests it discriminate the parietal from the occipital lobes better seen on a parasitical sections then a temporoximital notch you can delineate in on a sag images with at the junction of the transverse sigmoid junction Arterial anatomy is also very important to see on a routine axial images because in a routine T2 images, what we are seeing is a flow void. So try to look and delineate the arterial anatomy. Like this is ICA, this is MCA, this is basilar, this is the PCA, this is again the the uh, MCA branch, and the MR NGO provides both intra and extra cranial excellent delineation of the anatomy. Like this is posterior circulation, this is anterior circulation. To so start chasing any as the bolus of the contrast. So this is the ICA, the petrus, then the cavernous. This is supraclinoid ICA bifurcation. Then there is a A1, A2, and similarly this is M. M1, M2, and the cortical branches. Similarly, the posterior look, start looking at the vertebral arteries. This is the right vertebral artery, left vertebral artery. Look for the basilar artery, and then the, the PCAs, the P1, P2, P3, and cortical branches. In extra cranial, the arch of aorta, the brachiocephalic trunk, you can clearly delineate the anatomy as in the contrast enhanced with the top MR images. Then, uh, the uh, eloquent areas, I have already shown the two important, the uh, localize the central sulcus, delineate the motor strip, demonstrate the, the sensory strip. The uh, other important is the Broca's area. This is along the, just delineate the sylvian fissure and the posterior ascending ramus. And in the inferior uh, uh, frontal gyrus, there is a Broca's areas. And Postro superior of the superior temporal gyrus, there is a Wernicke area. Then we have a white matter tract, the internal capsule or the and the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum can be clearly delineated on the midline digital images, which can be divided into the, the four parts, and it can be clearly seen on the axial images, the, the genu and the splenium. Then we have a the internal capsule, the anterior limb, posterior limb, and the genome, which should be delineated and seen all the scans, whether T1 or T2, and sandwich between the basal ganglia and the thalami. Then we have the, the, uh, the basal ganglia nuclei, the caudate head, then we have a putamen, then we have the globus pallidus, and then medially, as seen, we have the internal capsule and the thalami. In a coronal also similarly, uh, you can clearly delineate the, the deep gray structures separated by the internal capsule and the external capsule. The substantia nigra, which is along the anterolateral aspect of the, the, the midbrain, and uh, this is the red nucleus, you can clearly delineate by seeing the differential signal intensity. The thalami, the posteromedial to the internal capsule. Then the important uh, logical is the hypothalamic structures. It is when you can able to appreciate it, it on the midline sagittal images. You should be uh, when seeing the area in and around the suprasalar system. Though there are, logically we define it from the from the anterior commissure to the optic chiasma and the posterior commission to memory body. So this all area constitutes the hypothalamic area. Approach on MRI uh, remains same as discussed in the CT. Look for the abnormal. How to identify normal? Look for the asymmetry. Look for the differential signal intensity and then the pattern of enhancement. Most of the pathologies on MRI are T2 flare hyperintense and T1 hypo intense, like edema, inflammatory lesions, tumors, or hemorrhage. So try to delineate the specific pattern on such scans. So the lesions which have hypo-intense on T2 or hyper-intense on uh, T1, like paramagnetic substances, protein substances, acute hemorrhages, 
or in a T1 increase like the fat. So looking the other way around, the, which is odd man out, so you can reach at a certain diagnosis. Other important in an emergency to look for the hemorrhage signal intensity in a MRI. The simple way to remember the, the various signal intensity of the hemorrhages in hyperacute stage, the blood is just like edema. Edema means it is hypo on T1, hyper on T2. In acute phases, it opposite to the hyperacute phase. That is, this becomes hypo intense on titubated images. Then in the early subacute stage and the late acute stage, because of the met hemoglobin, this is T1 bright. So anything T1 bright on MR is a subacute stage. Then you look for the, the T2 images, whether it is dark on T2 or a bright on T2. If it is bright on T2, it is late subacute stage. That means the hemoglobin is extracellular. So extracellular met hemoglobin. And in a chronic, this is dark on both T1 and on T2. There are uh, means uh, MRI has a uh, indicated in, in almost you name any pathologies and MR has uh, the, its uh, clinical applications. So I will be just showing a few cases like in this case uh, the patient with the uh, left hemiparesis see subtle abnormality, the gyral swelling along the right frontal and parietal convex T. And when we do a diffusion images, you can clearly see the large area of the involvement, which is barely perceptible on a T2 images. So a corresponding ADC maps showing the clear large MCA territory infarction. SWI, just to look for the hemorrhage or characterizing the clot, there is nothing as visible and MR angiogram in the same setting shows the complete occlusion. Similarly, in a cerebral synovenous thrombosis, we may see uh, the various uh, hemorrhagic venous infarct with clearly delineation of the, the thrombus on a, the source images or the reformated MR venography images. This is uh, the, the, the cerebral vascular malformations. They are seen as a bunch of phloboids in the brain parenchyma. Look for this site and whether they are involved in the eloquent areas or non-eloquent areas. In our neoplasms, the most important is delineation of the lesion, whether it is intraaxial or extraaxial. If you're able to delineate half of the job is done, and then there are limited differential diagnosis, and then further characterizing in the various sequences. And MRI, because of the multiplanar capability, exactly localizes and characterizes the lesion along with its advanced imaging technique. Uh, this is another uh, representative image in which you know, you're just seeing a small ring enhancing lesion with the, the, the leptomeningeal and the pachymeningeal enhancement with the diffusion restriction. So this is a case of a, the meningitis, complicated meningitis with subdural lymphoma and the brain abscess. Similarly, the various uh, pathologies can be interpreted with high confidence uh, the, the, if a complete set of MR imaging is available, various pathologies can be delineated with that. Uh, this is the same uh, subdural lymphoma, but see the difference between the CT images which I have shown and this. This is clearly delineate the uh, enhancement of the, the meninges and the extra axial uh, CSF collection. This is uh, another patient with the, the smooth ring enhancing lesion. So in such lesions, look for the diffusion pattern. It is the, the, the core of the lesion is showing the diffusion restriction. The margin of the lesion showing us the T1 shortening and the, the margins are both uh, smooth in outer and inner margin. So this is highly suggestive of a pyogenic brain abscess.
we can further characterize with the MR spectroscopy in which we can show the succinate or a pyruvate uh, uh, peaks and characterizing it. In, in cephalitis also, by in, uh, adding the diffusion, we can clearly delineate the uh, pattern of the diffusion restriction and characterizing the pathology. And we may see uh, other patients like this is a cystic circus. We can see the the scolex, the lesions in different phases of evolution and clearly make a diagnosis with certainty. In MS also, the lesions can be delineated, their characteristic location, the enhancement pattern or a diffusion restriction or seeing the pattern like the Dawson fingers, we can reliably discriminate the demyelinating lesions from other infective pathologies. And neuroimaging is also useful in a craniospinal trauma by delineating the uh, diffuse axonal injury or other subtle micro hemorrhages and uh, other form of the traumatic brain injury, which can be indicated well on the various sequences. With this, I thank you, uh, Dr. Pesh. If there are questions, I'm happy to uh, take those questions. Yes. yes. Please uh, stop the uh, screen, sir. Yeah. A wonderful uh, presentation, very nice, good learning for all of us. So while we wait for any questions, just like to ask for the audience. Uh, so this uh, terminology of hyperdensity and hypodensity is in relation to what? What is the baseline for hypo isodense? On a, on, on a, a CT scan? Either first CT and then MRI. Okay, okay, okay. On CT, we take it in comparison to the gray matter, whether it is a, a same attenuation to the gray matter or it is a hypo or hyper. So in a, in a, in a uh, HUV, we call it that there is a differential attenuation of the gray and white matter on CT because of the differential myelin content and the differential vascularity. So in a white matter, usually the, when we measure it, with, it is usually uh, 25 to 35 HU of the white matter and 30 to 40 HU of the, the gray matter. So anything less than uh, 25, we call it as hypodense. And if it is more than the gray matter, like more than 40, we call it as a hypodense. The main differential, as I have said, is, is, is like the hemorrhage or uh, hypercellular tumors or a calcification. So we can uh, discriminate them significant reliability with, if we keep all the uh, points in mind. Right, sir. And in MRI, sir? MRI, it, it's an inherent, very superior spatial uh, uh, resolution. So it is clearly uh, indicated. So and anything uh, hyperintense to that, again, the reference standard is a gray matter only. So if anything is hyperintense to that, that is hyperintense or the vice versa. So then the other question for that we would like to know is the features of raised ICT on uh, CTs and MRIs, especially CTs. Okay, uh, raised ICR intracranial hypertension. So uh, there are uh, various, uh, like uh, the, uh, we start seeing like the optic nerves, the, uh, uh, the, there is a prominent perioptic sheets. Then we look at the, the posterior cyclova where the optic nerve uh, head enters into the globe. So there is a posterior circular flattening and protrusion of the optic nerve head. Then we see the other uh, signs like the, the partial empty shala. Then we see other uh, the spaces like uh, the mechal scape. And uh, recently there is another sign described in an acute setting. There may be the diffusion restriction along the optic nerve head. Right, uh, sir, is there any correlation with the radiological findings and the degree of ICT? No, uh, as per uh, the, 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 the results are very variable. Yeah, okay. it is uh, very difficult to correlate because the signs which I have four or five signs I had related, they may be seen in other conditions also, okay. or they are indirect manifestations. So we cannot uh, directly correlate one to one. So then, sir, uh, one very important question. So meningitis, so often obviously CT and MRIs are done. So they can be normal in MRI, the MRI in uh, bacterial meningitis? Yes. Yes, very true. What yes. we are looking on imaging on a CT or MRI is the complications associated with it, like the brain abscesses, the, the um, ventriculitis, subdural empyema, 
or other things it may be missed uh, i have seen the uh, around 30 to 50 percent of the scans may be normal in a meningitis yes, that is what yeah. I was so in, now there is a there are few techniques which can uh, pick up a subtle meningeal enhancement like in our institute we usually do a post contrast 3d flare sequence so that uh, we have found it very useful that able to pick up a very subtle meningeal enhancement which are not routinely picked up on a routine imaging like the the post contrast gradient sequence we used to do so we are in including the post contrast 3d flare sequence we are including in all maze all uh, uh, cases which are suspected meningitis so this contrast flare is able to pick up all the things all the meningitis yes mostly mostly it is very sensitive and there are studies also which have shown that the post contrast 3d flare able to pick a very subtle meningeal enhancement which was rarely seen or uh, uh, not picked up on a routine the this t1 post contrast images and sir your experience with viral encephalitis picking up viral encephalitis means uh, the uh, so viral encephalitis or this is viral encephalitis also bacterial yeah no, no, no. We, we can clearly delineate because in the viral encephalitis there there would want to be any meningeal enhancement there will be again uh, the more a pattern of a, a gyral diffusion restriction or uh, the cerebritis form so the the, the uh, problems come in discriminating like the fungal or a pathogenic but viral have a entirely different it's more encephalitis in a meningitis what we see is a meningovasculitis with meningitis so pattern is clearly distinguished in most of the cases though the, there may be uh, confusing cases sometimes so uh, t2 and t1 can be normal in viral encephalitis also so is uh, do you pick it for diffusion or do you yes yes uh, in in early stages the in, within i mean 6 to 8 hours they may be normal so diffusion section is always indicated uh, in delineating and characterizing the viral encephalitis especially in, in, in our part we commonly see like herpes japanese in a seasonal like you know dengue so we, we will clearly delineate the extent uh, and the severity of the, the this viral encephalitis better on a diffusion better image so but on diffusion can you say that this is viral encephalitis or just a abnormality which is better you know we can see the extent of the involvement and okay. then depending upon the pattern uh, means we have to say that uh, which viral encephalitis uh, and uh, with the reasonable we can discriminate it from the other infective or ischemic lesions right this final question is that this uh, <clears throat> so the mra and the mrv that we do this is digital and uh, both the contrast or only contrast what, like what is the no. name of the mra and mrv okay okay in mr ngo routinely what we do uh, like uh, the, uh, i i uh, already uh, uh, I, I think i thought i was uh, overshooting the time so i just uh, run through the mr slide so mr angiography is routinely done with a time of flight sequence we have a three sequences we will name this tof you must have a tof mr ngo or tof mr venography another is a face contrast which are both do not require the contrast we can do a uh, the contrast enhanced mr ngo for better delineation of the pathologies like if there are uh, intracranial stents or a coils and in those conditions the contrast in enhanced mri may be found is a better otherwise uh, the routine uh, mr ng without contrast is sufficient to delineate the both the intra uh, cranial and extra cranial vasculature right so lovely sir so i think there are no questions of the audience sir thank you very much thank you nice thank sir. you very thank informative you. and we will put it yeah. up on our youtube for the followers to review it sir thank you very much thank you